So this video is a follow-up to a recent video I did on dominant 7th arpeggios and I just thought I'd give minor 7th arpeggios the same treatment. Now I'm a big fan of using arpeggios when I'm soloing and improvising as an alternative or sometimes in addition to a scale-based approach and it just means you can really describe the chords that you're playing over in a clear way uh, it often sounds a lot better than just noodling up and down a scale shape. So I will take you through the theory of minor seventh arpeggios, then I'll talk about how you can lay them out on the fretboard. And I'll talk about my favourite fingerings, we'll go through the five different caged shapes, and I'll also be talking about how to make music with them. But let me begin by having a bit of a play, I'm going to improvise, and I'm going to try and restrict myself just to minor seventh arpeggios and see what happens. <laughs> theory and basically a minor seventh arpeggio is the notes from a minor seventh chord played one after the other or played separately. So we're dealing with four notes here and one way of thinking about it is it's a minor triad with an added seventh degree on top, in this case a flattened seventh. So let's construct a minor seventh arpeggio and just see how this theory stuff works in practice. Let's do this from an A starting note or an A root note and that's going to be our one then we need a flattened third, also known as a minor third. And all of this stuff is calculated in relation to the major scale. That's the starting point of a lot of things when it comes to music theory. So in an A major scale, the third degree is this note here. We've got A, B, C sharp. So C sharp is the major third. We want a minor third, so we just go one fret lower, a semitone lower, and we've got a C. So that is our minor third or our flat third. Uh, it doesn't matter where you play that note, you could play it there if you wanted to. So we've got our root, our flat third, then we need a fifth. So again, we're going to count up the notes in our A major scale. One, two, three, four, five. That's an E note. So now we've got root, flat third, and fifth. That's our minor triad. Those are the notes in a minor chord or a minor triad. And then we're going to have our seventh on top of that. Now the seventh in the major scale is this note here, this is a G sharp, but for a minor seventh arpeggio we want a flat seven or a minor seven, so again we'll just go one fret lower, we've got a G note here, that's going to be our flat seven. So we put all of that together, we've got our minor seventh arpeggio, we've got an A, a C, an E, and a G. And then you can finish on an A, an octave higher if you like. So that would be one simple way of playing this minor seventh arpeggio and it's important to think about this in a few different ways I think. You've got the shape on the fretboard, you've got the actual note names themselves, so if we're playing an A minor seventh arpeggio, A, C, E, G, back to A again, the note names are going to change depending on which minor seventh arpeggio you're playing. And then you've got the functions of the notes or the intervals. So then we've got the root, flat third, fifth, flat seven, back to the root. And that stuff isn't going to change. You can play this minor seventh arpeggio from any root note, but the job that those notes are doing in relation to the root is still going to be the same. And all of those things are very important. We've got the pattern, the shape on the fretboard, we've got the actual note names, and then we've got the intervals or the function of the notes. And try and be aware of all of those things when you're working on your minor seventh arpeggios. 
let me take you through the minor seventh shapes that I would tend to use. And there's lots of ways to lay out this information on the guitar, but for me, I think the best starting point is the traditional five shape, call it caged system, if you like. And that's the way I tend to think about these things most of the time. So let's do that. And just like with the dominant seventh arpeggios, I tend to associate my seventh arpeggio shapes with the related chord shape. So if we're starting in the fifth position here, let's do this in the key of A minor, we've got an A minor seventh chord shape, and then around that, I've got my minor seventh arpeggio fingering. So the chord shape I would use is this one here. It's an A minor seven played, just barring at the fifth fret with the first finger, and then I've got the seventh fret on the A string as well. That's the chord shape. And then the arpeggio looks like this, and we're starting off with the root note, minor third, fifth, flat seven, root, that's like we did it before, and then we're climbing up into the second octave. This C note here is our highest note, and then we're descending. So that's our A minor seventh arpeggio. Notice the similarities between this and the A minor pentatonic scale, they're very close. And in fact, the minor seventh arpeggio just differs by one note, it's this D note here. If you include the D, which is the fourth, then you've got a minor pentatonic scale. So important not to confuse the two, they've both got quite a distinctive feeling and sound. So when you're practicing your minor seventh arpeggios, just be careful that you're not accidentally including that D note in there as well. So that's our first shape. If you like, you could refer to this as the E form because in caged terms, it's coming from that kind of chord shape. Uh, I tend to prefer just to call it position one or pattern one. So let's move on to the next shape. So moving up into the next zone of the fretboard, and this is the D form if you're thinking in caged terms. And the minor seventh chord shape that fits this arpeggio pattern is this one here. So. I've got the root note here, seventh fret on the D string, and then I've got fret nine, eight, and eight. So quite a nice little chord shape, that one. You can just play those top two notes by bending your second finger backwards if your fingers want to do that, or you could finger it like that. So you're playing those two notes with separate fingers with fingers two and three. So that's our A minor seven chord shape. And then the arpeggio, which fits that chord shape, looks like this. Once again, try and be aware of the notes and the intervals as well as the pattern that we're using here. So we've got root, flat third, fifth, flat seven, root, we've got a flat third on top. And we can come down below the root here, so we've got the flat seven, fifth, and third. And again, as with the dominant seventh arpeggios, I would tend to practice this starting and ending on the lowest available root note in this particular zone of the fretboard. So in the case of this pattern, this A note here is the lowest A note. So I'm going to start there, ascend to the highest note in this pattern, and then I'm going to come down. That's my lowest note. And then I'm going to come back up and finish on the root. So we're hearing it as an A minor seventh arpeggio, you're not kind of starting here and you're kind of hearing it as an inversion there. It doesn't work quite so well so I would encourage you to start and finish on this root note and the drill I tend to do is to play the chord shape, hearing that sound and then play the arpeggio up and down from root to root and then maybe just play that chord shape again. Up into the next zone of the fretboard, this is the C form or pattern three, I would tend to call this. We've got our octave shape here. The chord form that you could use here would probably be this one here. So A minor seven chord, we got fret 12 on the A string and then 10, 12, and 10. And then the arpeggio that fits around that chord shape looks like this. Once again, starting and ending on that root note. Mm -hmm. 
the next shape is here. We've got the A form, I suppose you could call it, so I'm barring at the 12th fret, and then I've got the 14th fret on the D and 13 on the B. That's our chord shape. And then the related arpeggio shape. And then the final shape, we're getting quite high up the neck in the key of A minor, but the chord I would play would probably be this one here. So this is fret uh, 17, 15, and then barring three notes there at the 17th fret. You could just leave out the note on the A string and just have that, have that muted. And this is kind of the G form, it's that zone of the fretboard. And then the arpeggio shape looks like this. You've got a choice with this one. Some of the notes at the 17th fret you can play with your little finger or you might just want to stretch up with your third finger. If you're playing this high up the neck it's probably easier to stretch with your third finger. If you're playing it down an octave might be more comfortable to use your little finger a bit more. So those are the five minor seventh arpeggio caged shapes. This is really essential guitar fretboard knowledge so do the work, do those drills, chord playing the arpeggio up and down, alternate picking, metronome, all of that stuff. It's important that you know this stuff and then we can start making music with it. So one of the advantages of being fluent with these arpeggio shapes is that you're able to play wherever you want on the fretboard. If you're playing over an A minor 7 chord, obviously you don't just want to be locked in one zone of the fretboard. You want to be able to solo wherever your ear or your imagination takes you and that's what being fluent with these arpeggio shapes will allow you to do. Another advantage of being familiar with these shapes is that you're able to connect them smoothly when playing over a chord progression. So if you're doing that, often you don't want to have to move horizontally. You want to be able to stay in the same position and smoothly connect to the next chord. So in theory, you should be able to find all 12 minor seventh arpeggios in any given zone of the fretboard. So in this zone of the fretboard here, this area of four or five frets, I should be able to find all 12 possible minor seventh arpeggios and the same thing with all of the other zones of the fretboard. So my favourite exercise for working on these smooth arpeggio connections is the same exercise that we looked at in the dominant seventh arpeggio video. So we just take a pair of chords and we're playing eight notes, eight eighth notes per chord and we're just trying to connect smoothly to the nearest note in the next chord. Let's see how this would work with an A minor 7 arpeggio connecting to a D minor 7 arpeggio. And I'm just going to stay in this zone of the neck. So for A minor 7, I'm using that arpeggio pattern. And for D minor 7, I'm switching to that arpeggio pattern. So it's a different shape, but it allows me to stay in the same zone of the fretboard. And the idea is this, I'm playing eight notes per chord and I'm just going to continue in whatever direction I'm going in, whether it's up or down, and I'm going to connect to the nearest note in the next arpeggio. And once you get to the limit of the pattern, whether it's the highest note or the lowest note, you just ping back the other way. So let me try and demonstrate this. I'm going to start off on my root note, and I'm going to go up the A minor seventh arpeggio, one and two and three and four and. Then we're changing to D minor seven, and I want to continue ascending, but I'm going to go to the nearest note in the D minor 7 arpeggio, and that's this A note here. So now we're on the D minor 7 chord, so I want eight notes here. Um, here I'm getting to the top of the pattern, so I'm going to go back again. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we're switching back to the A minor 7th arpeggio. This time we're descending, so the nearest note descending in an A minor 7th arpeggio is going to be this E note here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on through the exercise. So then we're back to D minor seven. So let me play a bit of that exercise for you. And the interesting thing is the connections are always happening in different places. I don't know quite how long this exercise goes on until it starts repeating on itself, but it takes quite a while before it starts repeating. So it's 
a really useful exercise. It really makes you think as well. It's not an easy exercise, but let me play it through for you slowly. Let's talk about playing over a chord progression then and specifically playing over the chord progression that I used at the start of this video. So we're in the key of A minor and essentially it's a minor blues. So we've got the 1, 4, 5 minor 7th chords. So A minor 7, D minor 7 and E minor 7. And there's a slight twist towards the end of the progression where I'm throwing in an F major 7. So I suppose that's kind of a flat 6 major seventh chord just to spice things up a little bit you don't need to worry too much about that chord it's still essentially a minor blues in a minor and i soloed over that trying to use exclusively minor seventh arpeggios so a minor seventh arpeggios over the one chord d minor seventh arpeggios over the four chord and e minor seventh arpeggios over the five chord let me take you through roughly what i was doing when i was playing over that progression earlier and it was an improvised solo, so I'm not going to take you through every single lick and every single note. For those of you who do want to learn what I played note for note, I will try and accurately tab that out and put it up on my Patreon page. But really, I want to focus on what I was thinking when I was playing over that chord progression and the kind of arpeggio shapes that I was using. So I started off... with something like that. It's kind of a slow, funky... 16th note kind of groove so I was using those arpeggio shapes but one of the ways to make them sound interesting is just to use a little bit of rhythm so I was trying to get some syncopated funky rhythms in there but I'm just coming straight out of our pattern one a minor seven arpeggio shape here um, and then we're going to the four chord and I play something like this So just straight up the D minor 7th arpeggio shape in the same position. And one thing I think I did was I started playing D minor 7 whilst the backing track was still on A minor 7. So in that last bar of A minor 7 I was already playing the D minor 7. And that's quite a good little soloing trick. It's kind of leading the listener, taking your ear to the next chord and anticipating it. And that can often sound really good. And it's it's the opposite of kind of panicking and reacting to the chords as they go past. It's, you're confident enough to know what's coming and you're leading the listener in that direction before the actual chord change happens. So I think I was playing, playing that chord just before the actual chord change. Then we headed back to the one chord and I played something like this. So really just coming down the arpeggio shape there. And I think I kind of jumped down to play the C note here rather than playing it up here. It just seems to flow a little bit better like that. And then heading to the five chord, E minor seven. So I'm coming out of this C form shape. And then jumping into the next shape. So I'm kind of connecting two of these caged forms together, going from that shape and then connecting into this shape. And then for the F major seventh chord, I'm just 
playing one of the notes from the chord. So I'm sliding up to this A note here, which is the third of this chord. And then I think a little bluesy lick to round off the first chorus of my solo. So that's the first chorus of my solo, just trying to keep it quite simple, rhythmic, and lots of space between the phrases as well. Then into the second half of the solo, and I wanted to mix things up a little bit, I stepped on a fuzz pedal, but started in a similar kind of way, so simple rhythmic ideas. So just in that same zone of the fretboard. Then I think I'm connecting up the fretboard with this kind of idea. So this is really a triad based idea. And remember that within an A minor seventh arpeggio, you've got a couple of triads. You've obviously got an A minor triad, A, C and E, but if you think about it, you've also got a C major triad in there. You've got the C, E and G. So you can actually just think triad shapes. And here it was just A minor, C major, A minor, and then C major there. So I've worked my way up the fretboard. Then I'm into this kind of zone, so A minor 7 here. And I want to connect to the D minor 7 arpeggio, and I think I do something like this. So I'm coming down into this D minor 7th shape. a little bit of bending in there so just because you're using arpeggios doesn't mean that you can't do all of the usual guitar techniques and expressive things so quite often quite often I'll bend notes here I think the flat 7 is often quite a good one to bend so it's a C note in the case of a D minor 7th arpeggio you can give that just a little bluesy bend or or bend the flat 7th up a tone to the root. So that's the four chord. And I want to connect back to the one chord in the same position. So I'm coming into that shape from the D minor seven. I might play some lower notes as well so you can just connect horizontally along the fretboard there so and then for the final part of my improvisation I've got some bending ideas so we're on the five chord here E minor seven and again I'm bending the flat seven up to the root of that chord And then connecting to the F major 7th chord here. So just aiming to hit chord tones there. So, or maybe playing a, a major 7th arpeggio. Maybe that's a, another instalment in this series. I can look at major 7th arpeggios, but that would certainly fit at this point in the progression. Um, and then we're back to the back to the one chord. I think I'm ending with just a little bluesy bend. So that's my solo, roughly speaking, but I think what I'd like you to do is not learn that note for note, but just to take some of those concepts and try and do your own thing with them. So maybe just think about some of the ways I'm connecting those arpeggios, maybe some of the little licks and bending things you can try and get in there, but do your own thing rather than trying to copy me. For those of you who are interested in the gear that I'm using today, the basis of the sound is my Jazzmaster into a Vox AC30. This Jazzmaster is a 65 reissue from five or six years ago, I think. And the AC30, again, that's a reissue, I think, from the 1990s. Now, I've not seen many of them in this red colour, but I do like the red colour. I'm using a couple of pedals today, and the solo that I played at the start was a solo of two halves. In the first half, I used quite a restrained almost clean sound but I did have a bit of overdrive and that was coming from the J Rocket Archer pedal and then in the second half of the solo I switched off the Archer and I switched on the Fuzz Face and my Fuzz Face is one of the currently made Jimi Hendrix series Fuzz Faces I think it's silicon based 
Uh, it does sound really excellent. And actually on the backing track I was also using a Phase 90 for some of those funky rhythm sounds. So let's have a few sounds then. And this is the guitar just going straight into the AC30 which I'm running fairly clean. It's and then for those rhythm guitar sounds it was pickup switch in the middle position and then a bit of Phase 90. Great sound, I do like the Phase 90. And then the Archer Overdrive sounds like this. And then the Fuzz Face. So that's it for this video. Good luck getting your minor seventh arpeggios together and getting them into your playing. Over on my Patreon page, I'm going to tab out my introductory solo so you can learn that note for note if you want to. And I'll also put my backing track up there as well. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time.